We interviewed today's guest almost three years ago about Hofstra Northwell's fairly new medical school. A lot has changed since then, and Dean of Admissions, Dr. Rona Woldenberg, is going to bring us up to date on what's new at the Zucker Medical School at Hofstra Northwell University. Welcome to the 333rd episode of Admissions Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. I'm Linda Abraham, the founder of Accepted and the host of this podcast. My mission and passion is to help you get to that delightful instant when you can high five the person next to you and shout, yes, I'm in, not only in, but in at the best program for you. Before we get to our guest, I want to mention that if you missed the live Ask Me Anything on Med School MMIs, and have been invited to an MMI, don't miss the recording of our event. Two MMI experts covered a lot of ground in this Ask Me Anything. Topics include what is a typical MMI like, what are schools looking for in an MMI, and how to prepare effectively for your MMI. Plus, there was a brief mini mock MMI with a participant. Watch it today at accept.com slash 333 MMI. The Zucker Medical School at Hofstra Northwell University has a lot going on as it enters its teen years, a new name for starters. To tell us more about this young, innovative medical school, I have invited back to Admissions Straight Talk, Dr. Rona Waldenberg, Associate Dean for Admissions at Zucker Medical. Dr. Waldenberg earned her MD at the University of Pennsylvania. She is board certified in diagnostic radiology and neuroradiology. In addition to her duties as Associate Dean for Admissions, she is also a professor at Zucker, School of Medicine, at Zucker School of Medicine. Dr. Woldenberg, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you. I am delighted you can speak with us today. Now, for those listeners who may not be that familiar with the Zucker School, what would be the first thing that you would want applicants and potential future physicians to know about it? So there are a couple of guiding principles of the school that I think um, are different from what you would consider as traditional medical schools. One is that we are learner focused as opposed to teacher focused. So that okay. means that the education is very much driven by the learner and, and that's critical. The other thing is we're very much about a learning and action type of style. We don't believe in a passive learning process. Our students are engaged from day one in clinical medicine, and that's best evidenced by our EMT curriculum, which our students engage in in the first nine weeks of medical school. They all will become licensed EMTs in the state of New York, and that's their introduction to medicine in our school. And you can imagine how getting that EMT certification allows them to learn team-based approach, but also to be an active learner. And, and really, that's the goal active learning and learner-based school environment as opposed to teacher-based. And, and can you give me an example of how being a learner-based as opposed to teacher-based affects, let's say, the curriculum or the, um, a particular, the teaching of a particular subject? So it allows us to fully integrate the curriculum in the sense that we don't have tenured faculty in biochemistry or tenured faculty in anatomy that can only come out of their labs at certain points of time so that the curriculum is structured around the teaching schedule as opposed to the learning schedule. Here our curriculum is constructed so that it allows the learner to get a, a, a comprehensive approach to a patient where they can learn in an integrated fashion so that they're learning biochem of the liver while they're dissecting the liver in the anatomy lab, while they're looking at liver slides, while they're learning physiology of the liver, all at the same time, as opposed to disjointed learning biochem of, you know, glucose metabolism, dissecting the brain, learning physiology of the lung. It's a very integrated approach and, again, dictated by the need of the students not the need of the faculty member teaching the course. Got it. Is it competency-based at all? Is that 
does that, does that the learner focus extend that way or oh, oh, absolutely absolutely i mean the competencies uh they pervade all of the courses you know from you know professionalism to system-based practice to all of those components they they permeate the entire curriculum they are very front and center in the dean's letter the mspe letter and so on and so forth as our students move through the curriculum all right yeah since we spoke three years ago, the Hofstra Northwell Medical School became the Zucker School of Medicine. I think you gave me the full name a minute ago. It's Donald and Barbara, uh, Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Um, can you tell us about the gift that triggered the name change? Absolutely. So um, Donald and Barbara Zucker are our benefactors, our main benefactors. Um, they gave a uh, $60 million gift of which a lot of money, a lot of money of which 50 million is dedicated specifically to scholarship. And, you know, that's critical. I mean, we're in a time now and there's a lot of press about schools going loan free, tuition free, et cetera, et cetera. And all really with the primary focus of making this educational I'm sorry, making this education as affordable as possible for students. Um, we're proud of the fact that our students tend to be in the lower third, the lower third of actual loans that need to be paid back after medical school. We meet with each student one-on-one, -on -one, trying to help them develop a plan, a financial plan. Uh, we put out every dollar we have, and upward of 70% of our students get some form of coverage in the school. And the Zucker uh, gift has obviously enabled us to really up those amounts and make it as financially feasible as, for students as possible. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's obviously you're, you're, you're just going off the interest, the, the earnings on the, right, the, of the endowment, but that still is an awful lot of money. And I'm sure it, it, if you're in the lower third, lowest third, then clearly you're giving a lot and, and helping your students a lot with, the, with financial support. Now let's look at the Zucker medical application process. Any tips for the Zucker secondary? Um, so our secondary is sort of pretty much fact-based. We don't make you uh, go and write five, six additional essays. Uh, yeah. We do ask um, something about um, an obstacle that you've overcome and how you've addressed that. And it's interesting. We get a lot of uh, good answers to that. Um, I think it speaks to resilience, and that's really what we're looking for as one of the attributes that we want our applicants to have as physicians. You know, it's critical to be resilient. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to see horrible outcomes despite uh, Herculean efforts um, to save patients' lives, to treat patients' diseases. You have to be resilient. You have to be able to um, accept your failures, whether they're your own or imposed by the limitations that uh, medicine at least has at this point in time. But you know, we, we need you to be resilient to be an effective medical student and a, a good physician going forward. So that's really the focus of it. It's meant to be a paragraph. It's not long. Uh, we ask a couple of other fact-based questions, but it's, we don't, you know, we know what goes into these applications to start with, and we don't really want it to make it that much more difficult for applicants to apply. All right. One of the questions that you ask on the secondary is if you're currently not a matriculated student, please indicate what you've been doing since the time of graduation until now. Do you prefer students who've taken a gap year? And well, again, what, are you just looking to see that they're not lying on the beach? I mean, what, um, you know, even lying on the beach sometimes may be okay. Uh, depending. It's great. Uh, it's great. <laughs> I think we can all benefit from it now. And right. Then. You know, I think, you know, um, we sort of follow what is the trend um, in medical education, and that is um, a lot of students do some gap time. 30% yeah. um, of our student body comes straight from college. The rest, 70%, do at least one gap year. And, you know, that gap year varies. It may be research-based. It may be Teach for America. It may be Peace Corps. It may, 
you know, be any, it may be scribing just to get more immersed in a clinical environment. So there's no one right thing to do. I think if an applicant um, can explain sort of the rationale behind the gap time, what they've gained from their gap experiences, um, I think that's helpful. Um, medicine is a long journey, so, and it keeps going, uh, even at my age, which is old. Um, so um, I think, you know, you want to make sure that an applicant is ready to undertake uh, the professionalism and the responsibility that come with being a physician and being a med even beginning as a medical student. So um, uh, we encourage it, but obviously it's not necessary. Whatever works for the applicant. Okay. All right. Now I understand that uh, Zucker is now using the Casper and the MMIs. Why the Casper in addition to a secondary? What is it giving you that the secondaries or the primary haven't given you so far? So, you know, the the Casper is sort of what you call a situational judgment test. And um, it allows us on a front end, you know, to sort of screen applications for a component of professionalism. Now, there's literature that's come out uh, uh, of UC San Francisco, specifically uh, UCSF, um, about how professionalism in medical students predicts professionalism in medical practice. And there was work done by uh, Dr. Papadakis, um, who specifically highlights that, um, how it is a predictor. So what we're trying to find out is um, the professionalism of the applicant pool. Uh, as you may know, I think last year, through the AAMC, 92% of the applicant pool took CASPER because one of the schools that they applied to, which is now 40, mm -hmm. I think, or 40 plus at this point, require CASPER. So every applicant applies to more than one school. So there's going to be some overlap there. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it, it helps us on the front end um, in terms of assessing the professionalism of the applicant. And then once we have a CASPER evaluation, um, you can go on to the MMI and use your MMI to be a little bit more mission specific for your school, looking for specific attributes that may resonate in your uh, educational environment. And what are the specific attributes that Zucker values above others? Well, I would say, obviously, because we're in a small group collaborative learning environment, teamwork is critical, um, uh, feedback and self-evaluation. There's a lot of that that goes on in our school. It's a constant uh, component of our curriculum assessment, self-assessment. So those things um, are, are very important. Leadership at the same time as teamwork, also important given the nature of our, our group learning. Can you be a leader as well as a team player at the same time? Obviously, something that underlies all aspects is um, judgment, um, moral, ethical construct, things like that. That comes a little bit more front-ended. But I, I would say that teamwork, leadership, um, self-assessment and uh, understanding of assessment are probably the critical factors. A willingness to take criticism and, and, and grow, you know, grow, take it constructively. How to give it and how to receive it at the All same right. time. You yeah. got to be able to do both. True, true. Yeah. Now, um, you and I spoke a little bit last week and you talked about the change in the traffic rules that uh, AMC put out last spring. How has that affected the medical school? So actually, um, I'm hoping that a lot of your listeners, please log on. This is a commercial. Log on. <laughs> look at those traffic rules. Absolutely. Um, we talk about them on every interview day here. Uh, we put an insert in the applicant's folder to make sure that they're aware of them because it is a change and it's important. It's, it's incredibly important for the applicant because certain schools have policies that if you violate those rules, you can jeopardize your acceptance in a particular school. So um, I think they're critically important. But as, it, as far as it translated into the process, 
medical schools can no longer communicate with one another. It used to be, um, um, especially on the back end of the process, when it came to wait list, when it came to acceptances off the wait list, schools would communicate, say, I'm taking X who's holding a spot in your school. They have to Y time frame to decide, et cetera, et cetera. We can no longer do that. Schools cannot communicate um, with one another, and we have to communicate directly with the applicant and 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 rely on the applicant to give the, us information if they are willing to. Now, all of us were really uh, quite concerned about how this would impact our process, all of the schools. And um, I think what ended up happening, at least for us, is um, it enabled us to create a process um, that improved our communication with our uh, applicants and our accepted applicants and our waitlisted applicants. It not only improved it, but it allowed for a constant communication. Um, and in doing so, I think we were able to figure out which students were more interested in staying with us, which were not. And it allowed us, believe it or not, to recruit our strongest class to date. So wow. um, although we anticipated it to be a little bit more of a difficult experience, again, it allowed us to develop processes that ultimately ended up uh, working in our in our favor. When an applicant, when an applicant, let's say, is, well, you, you mentioned the communica effective communication. What is effective communication like from the applicant side? You know, at this point, I'm getting calls and emails. When should I hear from this? I submitted my secondary. When should I hear, you know? Right. And once they interview, it's when am I going to hear back? And if they get waitlisted, it's when am I going to hear back? And some schools completely discount letters of intent or subsequent communication from applicants. Where does Zucker stand? So I, I think, you know, with specific regard to letters of intent, they really come to life at the back end of the process. You know, when you're holding a school and you're, you know, you're down to one spot, one school, and, you know, you're waitlisted at your first choice. So, you know, that's where the letter of intent really is valuable to send a letter of intent prior to that April 30th date. Although now it's interesting, and this is something that we didn't mention, Linda, but I think has also been helpful in um, the process, and that is that now, um, according to the rules or the recommended rules, you have to cut it down to three schools by April 15th. So whereas previously there wasn't a lot of activity at the end of April prior to the one spot, one school, them trimming it down to three schools really has opened the doors for other acceptances to occur prior to the one spot, one school, which favors the applicant because yes. they still have time to, to decide and they know a little bit earlier. We had students at the back end of the game that till April 29th, they were holding 10 schools. Uh -huh. um, I think nine, we actually did the numbers, ran the numbers, and we had 19% that were holding more than five schools on April Whoa. 29th. Whoa. And, you know, we know, and you know, as somebody who's involved in this process, um, and it may differ in different parts of the country, but we're in the Northeast, right. we're, we're in New York, we're in a very heavily populated, very competitive area. You know, we know that students are not considering 10 schools at that last date. They sort of may have narrowed it down. And it's unfair to those who are waiting for those floodgates to open. And, you know, where the numbers were that a third of the group were sort of holding, the third of the applicant pool were holding all of those spots prior to April 30th, okay, wow. but yet a half of the applicant pool gets accepted at the end of the game we've maybe made a little bit more balance there. So I think that that's been very helpful uh, to the applicants and much fairer for them in this process, especially that group that's gonna get in, it just allows yeah. it to happen at an earlier time. Yeah, it's in, it, the 19% the figure I was I was not aware of that. You know, in our, and again, it was in your In your pool, but I mean, that would, I mean, if, if they're holding 10 spots, obviously there's nine other schools that they're also holding 10 spots for. That's correct. That's correct. And, so, you know, and, and again, you know, it's it's not fair to that that that, no. that other group of applicants that are going to get in. 
but right. you know, let's open it up a little bit and give the schools a chance to put out some more acceptances prior to April 30th when it's less when it's less pressured and at the same time, you know, give the applicants more of a choice and, and a better opportunity to make a best choice. Right. Absolutely. That sounds like a very good improvement. Yeah. Now, when we la yeah. When we last spoke, Zucker had just graduated its second class. So that was about three years ago. So obviously you've graduated additional three classes. How are Zucker graduates doing in the match? Uh, amazing is the, is the one word <laughs> <Right>. in it. <laughs> question. Um, we are matching students all over the country um, in you know, the best residencies in all different fields of medicine, from cardiothoracic surgery to primary care. Wow. Uh, we run the gamut. I think that's one of the nice aspects of our school. We are not focused on any particular specialty. We are not focused on producing any specific type of doctor. We have 120 residencies and fellowships in the health system. We expose our students to all different types of medical practice from home care to specialized neurosurgery. So, you know, they have an opportunity to really engage at whatever, uh, in whatever uh, area they want to. And uh, we've had um, almost 100% match rate over um, the past three years. Last year it was 100%. I mean, it's, it's a very, very strong uh, process here and we're very proud of that. Well, that's great. On kind of the other end of the of the spectrum, both in terms of time and and perhaps um, test scores, I guess you could talk about. Um, I frequently get calls from applicants who are, let's say, very challenged in the medical school application process. Okay, um, and I'm sure you get these kinds of calls too, or speak to people like this, and so, go something like, you know, I really, really want to be a doctor. I know I'd make a great doctor, but either, but they can't show that they can handle the demands, either the academic, the interpersonal, or the emotional. You mentioned resilience at the, at the beginning of the call. What is your advice for that person? So, I mean, there are a lot of different approaches to it. Firstly, when they are actually going through the process, you should always have a plan B and a plan C in case you don't get in. It's it's a competitive process. It's about a two to one right application to acceptance and uh, about 50,000 applicants for about 25 plus 28,000. Linda, you're, you're checking my numbers, but I, I, I think I, I think it's actually I think there are about 50,000 accepted medical uh, allopathic medical students accept it every year. That's the number I remember, but there's about a hundred thousand, maybe, maybe. No, know? I think I, I, you're right. All right. Well, I'm going to go by, I'm going to go with your number. I'm right. going to put money down on this one. So okay. Yeah. I'll let you, I'll, I'll go with you. Yeah. But it, it is about, it's, it's, I, one thing I know it's about 40%, slightly over 40% are accepted. Yeah, it's like 4%, sure. something right. like that. That's the yeah. last that I, I and heard. Actually osteopathic is a little less. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So um, obviously that is a possibility, right? So if yeah. you're applying to allopathic and you're really not 100% sure, osteopathic is something to consider. Um, and that's a plan B. Um, it can be a little less competitive depending on, you know, in terms of scores and numbers, right. you know, right. so that's a B. The other thing is, do you consider going to a foreign, a good foreign MD? Not necessarily um, the for-profit environments that may be out there, but a good foreign MD program. Israel has yeah. that you, you don't have to be Jewish, you don't have to speak Hebrew. Uh, Sackler, Technion, there are right. programs out there, Australia. Um, so if you're willing, and th those are some things to entertain, you know, depends how badly you want this. Uh, the other thing that I always recommend students to do is. Um, to consider doing a medical master's program. We do not have one at Hofstra, uh, but there are plenty of them around the country that are embedded in some of the medical schools. That allows you and to speak to just what you had asked about to prove that you can do it. In other words, you can sit in a medical school class, you can take the same courses and as the medical students and perform. Now those programs do have a certain MCAT requirement usually and a certain GPA requirement. They want to know, you know, where you stand. But 
and they're not cheap. So again, there's an affordability question there as well. Uh, but those programs, I think of all the master's types of things you can do, they specifically answer your question of how do you show a medical school that you can do well in a medical school environment. And what better way than sitting in the class with the medical students and performing as well, if not better, than they do on their assessments? Okay, right. Okay, well, that's great advice. Uh, we we frequently recommend post back programs as well as Plan Bs and Cs. Um, and then and then uh, in terms of the interpersonal and emotional requirements of medicine, I think it's a little bit harder to deal with. Because uh, sometimes we have people who seem to be very fragile emotionally, and they say Correct. they want to go into medicine, and that's a little bit tougher to deal with. Absolutely. Look, you know, um, you know, that's you know, and that's something that you, you know you you bring out, and you know, again, if you know, to be a fair and to give try and give good advice. You have to be careful. You know, we ask about resiliency, but you have to be careful what you reveal in an application. You know, you don't want people to necessarily see that you are a basket case, to use a colloquial term, or have been one. You have to be a little careful. Sometimes it's just the verbiage and how, how you express it, you know, because, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but people want to know that you can almost you know, that you, whatever you challenge you've been through, you have processed it and you have put it in such a place that you can actually deal with other people's challenges effectively, effectively and right. not necessarily just, um, shall I say, reawaken within you your challenges okay. yeah. while you're dealing with other people's pain. I think, you know, that's the whole empathy uh, component there. Um, and sometimes people are so caught up in their own self that they can't necessarily be empathic. And I think that's critical for a physician. So um, you have to be careful, you know, reveal what you can, because they want, we want to know you're human and you know what it is to have challenges and to overcome them. But on the same, at the same time, you know, don't do the focus on the overcoming. Correct. Exactly. It's all in the spin. It's all how yeah. it's all how you present that, and and I think that's critical. And and just to add one thing on, remember who's you know you don't know who's reading on the other side, and what that reader has been through personally on their own. So you know you have to be a little bit careful because you know the you know just as you've undergone challenges, the person on the other side may have as well. So you have to sort of be a little sensitive to, to that piece also and be aware who's actually reading your application. That's right. That's actually very true in life. I sometimes like to say, um, I years ago we had a stroller and it was an old metal Perego, heavy metal Perego stroller. It was a double stroller. My husband and I were blessed with six kids. And it went through, we got it with the second one and it went through all the rest and we actually gave it away. It was still, still going strong after the sixth. And somewhere along the way, I think when number five was a baby, one of the metal pieces broke and I didn't, maybe it was number six was a baby and I knew I wasn't going to have any more and I didn't, I didn't want to replace it, but I was still using it a lot. I think it was when number six was a baby. And um, so I took it to some place that could solder it, solder the broken part. And I asked the, the workman, I said, do I have to be worried afterward that this is going to be a weak point that is going to be likely to break? And he said, no, the solder is the strongest part. So the, the point is when something, when you, you have to show that you're stronger as a result. Absolutely. Of the challenge, challenge you overcame, right. like that solder on that broken stroller Absolutely. all I know is still out there. Uh, That's but, a good analogy. Uh, I like that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So looking, looking forward on a different note entirely, what advice would you give to medical school appl applicants thinking ahead and planning to apply in 2020? In other words, we're not talking about this active cycle. We're talking about the one that will open right around June of next year. Um, well, I think obviously um, try and do your research. Um, our dean, Dr. Smith, likes to say, if you get into any allopathic school in the United States, you will be a good doctor because it is very hard to be an accredited medical school in the United States. 
uh, an allopathic school. We are going through our second LCME now round because obviously we did the first three rounds and we're fully accredited. You become fully accredited after you graduate your first class. And now we're already on round two, five years later. Um, it's very, very hard from UM, UME, undergraduate medical education requirements to GME, all of those things. You know, there's so much that goes into uh, being in an accredited school. You will be a good doctor coming from any of them. They are very different. The schools are different and how they teach medicine is different. And so you have to sort of look at what school is the best fit for you if you have the luxury of being accepted at more than one. You, another aspect of medicine that I like is that um, medicine is a meritocracy. You can go to any of those 150 and end up in one of the best residency programs in a particular area in the United States. You don't have to go to the top five U.S. News and World Report ranked school to get to a residency program in orthopedic surgery. It doesn't happen that way. If you succeed where you go, you will do well in the residency match process. So the important thing is to be where you're going to be happy because that is the place where you're more likely to succeed. And, and that's one of the really nice things about medicine, as opposed to some of the other professions where you have to go to X school if you want to do X uh, career. Medicine, okay. you succeed where you go, you will be successful. Our dean also ran an internal medicine residency program in one of uh, the top programs in Manhattan, and he basically said he would take the top tier from any school in the country rather than a bottom tier person from a very highly ranked school, because the top tier people are the ones who are really passionate about medicine and passionate about what they're doing. Right. That's great advice. Thank you. What would you have liked me to ask you? Um, I guess one thing is uh, maybe how, um, how we have sort of hit the ground running and become successful in a highly competitive environment. Please, um, that sounds like a great question. <laughs> and um, I guess, you know, a lot of that has to do with the resources that we have. Um, we are a small school, 100 students a class in a huge health system that um, has 23 hospitals um, in the system, but yet we've kept the school small because of our desire to have one-on-one -on -one relationships between our students and our faculty members and our mentors. Um, I think that that, um, that intimacy um, and um, the relationships have allowed our students really to succeed at a level um, very quickly. And the word is out about that. You know, what we talk, talked about, that student-centeredness um, yes. um, is critical. I think also, basically, um, what you learn in medical school is you're going to learn from your peers. You're not really going to learn from the professor who shows you the PowerPoint slides. It's really peer learning that allows you to become a good and successful physician. And here we just institutionalize that. We took that peer learning that has gone on in medical school for years. In my time, too, I can tell you, I, uh, my my friend who taught me Michaelis Menton and how that worked in biochemistry, uh, I remember that. I don't remember the biochem professor who stood in front of me just throwing out factoids on the slide. And we just put, we instant, we made the construct that will allow there to be the most effective peer-to-peer -peer learning. And, you know, by doing that, again, our students are confident, our students take ownership of their own learning, and that really translates into um, successful students. And they're carrying the banner. You know, they go out to the residency programs, um, they are showing our best and you know whether that's learning ultrasound is part and as a vital part of the curriculum from day one they learn ultrasound bedside ultrasound very adept at that whether it's the ambulance training there are so many different things um, that i think the residency directors see in our students um, that i think has allowed us to really uh, be one of the most successful new programs in the country that's great. I'm really glad you, you raised that. And it's, it's a fascinating answer. 
I don't, and I think we're just about out of time. Now, this has been absolutely delightful. I, I'm, I'm mad at myself. It took three, me three years to invite you back. Where can listeners learn more about the Zucker School of Medicine? Well, obviously, come to uh, medicine.admission.hofstra.edu. Uh, that'll, that'll take you um, to our admission page, but medicine.hofstra.edu, our admissions office, just look us up on the web. Um, we're there. We are participants in the AAMC virtual fair. So uh, that's a really good program. That's been, I think now will be the third year uh, running okay. where, you know, students can log on and visit all a whole host of schools around the country. We post up information. Actually, the last podcast we did, uh, Linda, was on that as well. Oh, wonderful. As, you know, we did post it on our page, on our uh, on our virtual booth, so to speak. Um, so there are a lot of resources and information. So I point students to the virtual fair uh, because I think it's a real opportunity. We go to various locations. We have webinars. Uh, so they should log on, look at our site and see if there's a webinar they want to jump onto um, and to get more information about the school. But we're always available to answer any questions, phone, email, you name it. You know, we're, we're there. Great. We're going to include links in the show notes at exhibit.com slash 333 to Zucker's website, as well as to other resources that may be helpful to listeners. And uh, Dr. Waldenberg just gave us a whole bunch of other resources that you can access. At this point, I want to just give you a quick reminder. You can access the great advice provided in our recent MMI called Ask, uh, M rather the recent MMI Ask Me Anything. Uh, you can watch the recording today at accepted.com slash 333MMI. Listener, thank you too for joining us for our 333rd episode. If you found this show helpful, can I ask a favor? Could you leave your feedback on iTunes or your favorite podcast site? It helps us get ranked more highly when you leave those reviews. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Bye.